Hello, the focus of this video is bacterial transformation. This is a technique in which a DNA plasmid is inserted into a bacterium. The first step in transformation is to obtain some competent bacteria. In this case, we'll be using E. coli. Competent bacteria have small pores in their membranes which allow plasmid DNA to pass through. Without these pores, transformation could not occur. Therefore, it is very important that you use competent bacteria for your transformation. Several strains of competent E. coli are available commercially. Alternatively, you can prepare your own competent bacteria by treating them with cesium chloride or electricity to create these membrane pores. Either way, once you have your competent bacteria, all you need to do is add the DNA and incubate the sample on ice. During this step, plasmid DNA attaches to the cell surface, but it's still too large to get through the small pores in the membrane. To help the plasmid DNA get through the pores, we heat shock the cells at 42 degrees Celsius. This sudden increase in temperature widens all of the pores and allows the plasmid DNA to enter the cell. We then cool the cells back down and allow them to recover in nutrient-rich media for about an hour. During this step, the cells seal up the pores through which the DNA entered. At this point, we'll have some cells containing the plasmid, but we'll also have other cells which did not take up the plasmid. We select for cells containing the plasmid by putting them all onto antibiotic agar plates. Since our plasmids contain a gene for antibiotic resistance, these plates will kill any bacteria that do not contain the plasmid. Therefore, any colonies that grow on this plate, shown as green circles here, consist entirely of bacteria containing our plasmid. We can then take these colonies and use them to inoculate larger scale liquid cultures for DNA or protein production. So in review, transformation is a pretty straightforward process. First of all, you have to have some competent bacterial cells that have small pores in their membranes. You add your DNA to these cells and then heat shock them at 42 C to widen the pores and let the plasmid pass through. The next step is to let the cells recover from the heat shock for a short time at 37C, and then put your whole mixture of cells on antibiotic agar plates that allow you to select for only the cells that took up your plasmid. The first thing you'll need to do for transformation is to prepare your antibiotic agar plates. Agar plates are usually made at a concentration of 40 grams per liter. In this case, since I want to make four plates and each of them will take 50 ml of agar, I'm going to make 200 ml of LB agar solution. Therefore, at a concentration of 40 grams per liter, I'm going to need 8 grams of LB agar powder to put in 200 ml of water. Once you have your LB powder weighed out, add it to your water and shake it vigorously. It's okay if you still see some clumps because those are going to dissolve in the autoclave. Speaking of which, your next step is to autoclave your LB agar solution. This will do two things for you. First of all, it'll sterilize your LB agar solution. Secondly, the large temperature increase inside the autoclave will initiate the gelling process, just like a batch of jello. Select an autoclave cycle that gives you 30 minutes at 121 degrees Celsius. Remember to wait until the autoclave cycle is completely finished before you open the vault door, otherwise you may get a steam burn. When you remove your LB agar solution from the autoclave, it should still be a molten hot liquid. You'll want to let it cool at room temperature for about 20 to 30 minutes before we make our plates. So, while the LB agar is cooling, we need to make our antibiotic. The antibiotic also needs to be sterile, but we can't put it through the autoclave because it is temperature sensitive. Therefore, we have to filter sterilize it in the biological safety cabinet. Pour the antibiotic solution into a sterile syringe with a 0.2 micron filter attached to the end of it. You can then insert the plunger and force the solution through the filter into a sterile 15 ml tube. Now you have a sterile antibiotic solution that you can add to your LB agar. Please remember though, some antibiotics are unstable at room temperature, so they should be stored in the fridge after you've made your plates. At this point, your LB agar should be lukewarm to the touch. 
If it's still too hot to touch, you can cool it down the rest of the way by running cold tap water over your bottle. Make sure to constantly mix the LB agar and look for any signs of solidification. Remember, we want the LB agar to be lukewarm, but we don't want it to solidify before we pour the plates. Once your agar is cooled, it's time to make your plates. First of all, you need to add antibiotic to the LB agar. In this example, I'm adding 200 microliters of 100 mg per mil ampicillin to 200 mL of LB agar. If you're working with a different antibiotic, you might want to use either a different stock concentration or volume. Either way, once your antibiotic is added, give it a good shake to mix it up, but try not to create any bubbles. You can then pour your plates. Uh, typically, each plate will take around 30 to 40 ml. What you want to do is give each plate about a quarter inch of LB agar. It should be about 30 to 50 percent of the way full. You can see here that I've actually cooled down my agar too much. I only got to pour three plates and the rest of the agar is trapped inside the bottle. Once you've poured your plates, leave them in the BSC for an hour to solidify. Once they've solidified, put the lids back on and label them appropriately. Remember to include the type of media that you used, LB, and the type of antibiotic you used as well. Here we used ampicillin. Carefully label each of your plates then wrap them in plastic or foil to keep them from drying out. Once your plates are wrapped, you can keep them in the fridge for up to two to three months, depending on the antibiotic you're using. Once your plates are ready, you can start thawing out your competent cells. Competent cells are kept in the negative 72 or negative 80 degrees C freezer to keep them in the competent state. If they're allowed to thaw out at room temperature, the pores in their membranes will seal back up. Therefore, it is very important that you thaw the cells on ice to prevent the pores from closing. While your competent cells are thawing, you'll want to sterilize the bench with 70 or 75 percent ethanol. Also sterilize your gloves with ethanol. Once the bench is dry, light a Bunsen burner to keep the air around the bench sterile as well. Next, place some sterile Eppendorf tubes in the ice bath next to the thawing competent cells. Once your competent cells have thawed, split them into 50 microliter aliquots in the chilled Eppendorf tubes. Keep one aliquot of cells for every transformation reaction you plan on performing, but put the rest of the aliquots back in the negative 72 degrees C freezer. In the future, you can then thaw out these smaller aliquots instead of the larger cell vials. In this video, we're going to transform one aliquot of cells with a freshly ligated plasmid. When you're using a ligation reaction to transform cells, you want to add 5 microliters of the ligation mix to 50 microliters of cells. However, if you're transforming the cells with an intact plasmid, you want to use only 10 to 50 nanograms of DNA. You don't want to add too much DNA because then your transformation will work extremely well, the cells will overgrow the plate, and you won't be able to use them. Once you've added the DNA to the cells, let it incubate on ice for 30 minutes. Then give it a heat shock at 42 degrees Celsius for 20 seconds. Some strains require a heat shock of 30 seconds. Be sure to check the manufacturer's instructions to determine the time and temperature of this heat shock step. Once your heat shock is done, place the cells back on ice for 2 minutes. This will help them recover from that dramatic heat shock we just gave them. Once that two minutes has elapsed, bring the cells back over to the sterile bench and add 300 to 900 microliters of sterile SOC media to each cell aliquot. This SOC media is rich in nutrients and sugars, which helps the cells to recover. However, for that reason, it's also very easy to contaminate. SOC is usually kept at room temperature so we can see any contamination that may have occurred. Therefore, before you add your SOC media, you should always give it a quick shake to see if it's turbid from contamination. 
In a pinch, if your SOC media is contaminated, you can use LB media in this step, but your transformation efficiency may decrease. Once you've added the media to your cells, you'll need to incubate them at 37 degrees Celsius with 200 RPM of shaking for approximately one hour. You can keep your tube in place with a piece of tape, but make sure it's securely attached so you don't lose your tube. While your cells are shaking, take your agar plates out of the fridge and let them dry out underneath a Bunsen burner or in the BSC. Drying out the plates will help them absorb the cells that we add later on. Once the incubation step is over, remove the cells from the incubator and bring them back to the sterile bench. At this point, we need to add some of the cells to our agar plate. If you're using a ligation reaction to transform the cells, you'll probably want to add all of them. But if you're using an intact plasmid, you can add as little as 50 microliters. The last thing we need to do is spread the cells out on the plate. To do this, we use a cell spreader like the metallic one shown here. You need to make sure that the cell spreader is absolutely sterile, so spray it with ethanol and let that ethanol burn off. Then let the cell spreader cool because a hot cell spreader will kill all of your cells. Wave it up and down in the air a few times and then touch it to the top of your plate to make sure it doesn't form any steam. Here we have a little bit of steam, so we're going to give this one a few more seconds to cool off. The final test is to touch the spreader to the agar. If it melts the agar, it's too hot. But if the agar remains solid, then you're ready to go. Spread the cells out by moving the cell spreader in a circular motion like this for about one minute. You want to continue doing this until you feel a dryness on the plate. It should start to feel rougher. It is very important that you spread the cells out until the plate is dry. If any liquid remains on the plate, then the cells will not form colonies. Instead, they'll form a snotty mass that covers the entire plate and is useless. Once you're done spreading your cells, sterilize the cell spreader once again. Then you can incubate the plate at 37 Celsius overnight without any shaking. The next morning when you come in, hopefully your cells will look something like this. There should be several isolated small brown dots. Each of these is a bacterial colony that contains your plasmid. You can then use these colonies to start a small liquid culture that we can use for a plasmid prep. To do so, take a sterile pipette and pipette tip and carefully scrape off one of the colonies. You only want to scrape off one of the colonies here. Do not pick off two. Once you have a colony on your pipette tip, eject it directly into some sterile media and then incubate that overnight at 37 degrees Celsius with 200 RPMs of shaking. You can then use this small culture to prepare DNA for sequencing or for transformation into BL21 coli for protein expression. It's always a good idea to hang on to these plates just in case the colony that we picked contains a mutated or aberrant form of our plasmid. If this is the case, then you can go back to this plate and pick a few more colonies and test those plasmids instead of repeating this entire process again. In the unfortunate case that your air plate has no colonies on it, you'll need to do some troubleshooting. If you use the ligation reaction to transform the bacteria, then you may want to repeat your PCR digest and ligation steps. Alternatively, you can repeat the transformation process just in case you made a mistake, or you can try to increase transformation efficiency by adding more DNA to the cells or optimizing some of the other steps. However, it is important to mention that you should never add more than 5 microliters of ligation reaction to 50 microliters of competent cells, since the ligation buffer contains some components that inhibit transformation.